Hey, wow, when Ferdows told me you'll be a full house, <laughs> I didn't expect it to be this full house. But thank you so much to everyone for taking the time this morning um, to join um, Orang Laut SG for Panggilan Anak Pulau. So, yes, I think without further ado, we can start the session. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think like before we begin, I just thought um, I want to ask each of our panelists how did they come to do research or write on Southern Islands histories and stories? You know, were there like some personal connections or is it more of an individual personal interest? So maybe we can start with Imran. Thank you. Uh, um, hi, uh, good morning everyone. Usually I don't read from a script uh, because we only have 10 minutes. I better stick to the script and, and finish in time. Um, my personal connection, my mom's paternal side, so Datuk sebelah Ma is uh, orang Bintan, so they are all from Bintan. They even have that story. Some of you might know about Laksmana uh, Sri Rama, right? When he uh, committed regicide in 1699, right? There was a curse to Joh, keturunan. My mum's side apparently has that, that kind of thing, lah. Yeah, yeah. mine too. So apparently, are we orang Pulau, right? orang Bintan, dengan orang Singapura yang tinggal dekat Air Gemuro? Ah, that's another question. Eh? Orang Pulau atau tidak? Uh, my entry point and deep interest in our maritime heritage began when I started the Singapura stories. Nothing to do with the government Singapore stories. My own Singapura stories seminar series that ran from 2012 to 2016. Uh, two of the seminars seen here, shown here that look specifically at the smaller islands south of Singapore are Seminar 2 on Pulau Seking and Resettlement to Clementi, held at the National Library in 2014. Um, Normala Manap, myself, Ivan Quek, and uh, Suryani Sratman, Dr. Suryani Sratman from Malay Studies as well. That's, but that's way back in uh, 2014. And Seminar 6, Sudong, Kulau Sudong and Seni Silat Gayong at Malay Heritage Centre 2015. And of course, um, not yet, uh, we have uh, Asinia Daud, who is in the audience, uh, as well as other speakers, like Karazainal, Edwin Koo, and Dr. Saiful Nizam talking about that. Next slide. Uh, so, but. Uh, even, uh, in fact, there are three other projects uh, and seminars before and after the, the first two just now also widened my questions about maritime settlements and our cultural history. The very first uh, seminar in 2013 was on Bedo, and uh, Professor Hadija Rahmat is here in the audience as well, uh, which was on Singapore Island but very maritime oriented. oriented. Uh, many of the people were Javanese, but there were also people who are uh, Malay fishermen. So there's two sides to the settlement, right? There's always Laut and Darat, as you know, eh, Kampung. Uh, and had close links, you know, Bedok, with the small southern islands, especially for Jong and Kolek races. My most recent project for Singapore's offshore islands is for Pulau Ubin, again, the one that is uh, north, right, rather than south, which presents its own unique trajectory with its Malay, Bugis, and Bawainese populations. This was 2017 to 2018 documentation and 2020 to present uh, ongoing project. Um, by way of opening, I share the case of an almost, for, uh, next slide, almost forgotten place, Kampung Kuchai Lorong Tiga. Now, this is at Lorong Tiga Gelang, quite inside, but it, as you can see, it's surrounded by water. Very, very interesting settlement. Uh, this was the subject of Singapura Stories Seminar 11 in 2016. Now, um, this is interesting. What is the significance is that it uh, lies in the fact that there were core families from my interviews of the former residents, core families and newcomers. Who, uh, who rented houses at the perimeter. So the houses in the inside are more the core families. Huh? So this brings up the... Uh, the core families are, in fact, descended from Singapore River. They are the Orang Selat or Orang Laut of Singapore River. We forget, right, but they are, they are somewhere else. Um, they moved to Tanjong Ru, and then during the Japanese occupation, they were asked to move again. That's how they ended up in Lorong Tiga. Uh, but they are not Orang Kalang. Don't mistake them with Orang Kalang. So this allows us to think about layeredness and shifts across time. And also to consider how we use terms, orang selat, orang pulau, orang laut, orang kaum lain, how, how do we use these terms? Next slide. Um, so, this phenomenon of layeredness uh, is amplified there at Kampung Kalang, right? Uh, which comprises five settlement clusters. You can read them. Eh? Kampung Kalang proper, Kampung Kalang Pase, Kampung Kalang Bakau. I added some of them because this map does not show all five names. Kampung Kalang, Kampung Kalang Pase, Kampung Kalang Bakau, Kampung Rokok, and Kampung Kalang Batin, atau Senggera, the A dropped and Kampung Kalang Laut, five, five in all. Eh? And what's interesting is my current project with the National Heritage Board's Heritage Research Grant is to look at clubs, early town Malay clubs and associations. So actually in Kampung Kalang yang atas air itu, the water villages, there were no less than three clubs registered in those periods. I won't have, I won't go into detail, but that's very interesting, isn't it? So next slide. 
So the first question, uh, uh, I would like to therefore uh, uh, look at these four questions in relation to all the previous experiences. Next slide. Um, so the first question is, how might we situate our island realm within the wider seascape beyond uh, modern boundaries? You know, our political boundaries don't count, isn't it? And speci specifically in relation to Malay myth, law and cultural memory. Now to do this, maybe we need to look at, I'm just showing you so that you know where the islands are when we mention the names. Next slide. Um, to do this, we could look at some sources, right? Again, no time to go through it, but just a quick listing. I've written about this elsewhere, so it's easy for you to... Uh, and also, you can look at the text, but it's very difficult for you to find the info if you read the text. Um, so, Laratu Salatin and Hikai Hangtua, for example, both place Singapore uh, Straits, uh, the slut, as central to the uh, particular narratives about sovereignty and prosperity in relation to particular ruler and Sakai or Orang Laut populations, referring to the people of this region. Hikai Atsia and Tufat al Nafis. Uh, reflect continued significance of the Singapore waters uh, or the Selat uh, in maritime terms in the contest between Malays, Bugis, and Minang Kabaos over the Johor Royal Kingdom in the 1700s. So all these are super interesting to me. And next slide, what emerges is a picture of a Singapore population that was recognized for its crucial strategic importance alongside Bintan, Singapore and Bintan, eh? uh, for shipping and shipbuilding. Uh, contextualized against the kingdoms, of, we must always contextualize these developments against the Malay Kingdom. So there's a, there's a relationship eh, between the Orang Pulau, Orang Selat, Orang Laut, and the Malay Kingdoms. Malacca, Johor Riau, uh, uh, 14th century Singapura, and the Straits, uh, in the role uh, of uh, the Navy, for example. So uh, this place was recognized as a space for the Navy, the Laksmana, for example, is associated here. And the Shah Bandar post during the Johor Riau Kingdom in the 1600s. So the 1603 map. I think 1604 map, many of you know Shah Bandar is there, right? But it also tells you Sungai Bedok and Tanah Merah. These are all significant places um, uh, in the Singapore landscape. Uh, next slide. Um, so let's say we talk about uh, people like Badang. Badang is an orang benua from Benua Sayong. That's all the way up river at the headwaters of Sungai Johor or Johor River. So he's an orang benua, right? or sometimes we call it orang asal or orang asli. Yeah? So that's interesting. And he was later buried in Buru. Buru is an island offshore. Uh, and then you have uh, Patin Sapi. So again, uh, we need to place these kinds of developments against Malay kingdoms too. So can't just see it in isolation. Uh, next, uh, continued role of Orang Singapore at, uh, or the Orang Laut at Singapore River must also not be forgotten. They were important uh, actors up to the 1860s. And for example, if you read uh, uh, articles on their role, uh, as well as their shipbuilding, you'll know about the Sampan Panjang, which was a large sailing boat with two masts. Eh? Uh, which was swift enough to always beat European vessels during the annual regatta in Singapore every year. So we should not uh, forget uh, Singapore island itself was also home to important groups of Orang Selat, Orang Laut, and Orang Pulau. Uh, next question, therefore, the second question and the challenge is how to, next slide please, is how to construct complex histories of both top-down and ground-up developments, both colonial and pre- or non-colonial histories uh, that are autonomous. Eh? So, um, in relation to uh, colonial era and post-independence development, so they go alongside each other, you can't separate the two. I'm just showing this as an example, Pulau Sudong. Uh, you just look at some of the highlights I show you, so these things cannot be left out of the story. At the same time, we want to talk about the cultural history, but we also have these other histories. So, according to a particular, now this is something for us to find out uh, about, according to a particular Brita Harian interview in 1970, the founder of Pulau Sudong village was a Bugis. That, that again, you know, the, the, the in newcomers, this, that, that does not mean the population of Pulau Sudong had no Orang Selat origin. They did, but there must have been some admixture. That, that kind of thing we must embrace, acknowledge, and celebrate rather than try to own how, how we, aren't we all supposed to be indigenous? It's still indigenous. People migrated across islands, but there was definitely an openness to intermarriage. Next slide. Same thing with the people, people who were uh, islanders. They might be themselves intermarried and cross-connected across different parts of the archipelago. For example, uh, again, no time, but from my uh, research for Pulau Ubin, uh, you find out these things, right? Uh, so Pulau Ubin was administered from Pulau Tekong, the so-called capital of Pulau Tekong at Kampung Selabin, uh, by the descendants of Sultan Hussein Shah, one branch that you know was uh, lost control of the palace, and so they went there and established rule over uh, Pulau uh, Tekong Besar, Tekong Kecil, Ubin, Ketam, Serangung, Sejahat, Unong, Senyongkong. So they, they, they had their own little freedom, you could call it. Eh? And that was effective up to the uh, pre, before World War II. 
we don't know what happened after World War II, probably they lost control. Uh, but uh, then there is the person who is descended from Endot Bin Senin. If you've been to Pulau Ubin, you know there's a Jalan Endot Bin Senin. That's because he is the founder of the major Malay settlement there. Mum's side uh, has uh, links back to uh, Pulau Ubin itself and Johor. That side is actually Banjamasin. Yeah, the dead side is Banjamasin. And they lived at Kampung Kalang Pasir. Banjamasin at Kampung Kalang Pasir, right? So I thought it's a orang biduan de Kalang is orang selat. But then the Banjamasin people. So it's quite mixed up. The lawyer Salbia Ahmad once wrote about this the mixed nature of the heterogeneous mixed nature of the Kampung Kalang settlement. There are so five Kampung that I showed you. Next slide. Um, and we also need to appreciate the immense diversity of development uh, trajectories and experiences of the different islands. So again, no time to go through this, but look at this remarkable example. They didn't know that, um, can you imagine, the rural board excluded some islands, and they didn't know this particular island was inhabited. Read it. It's remarkable. So the colonial state was not aware. So basically, very autonomous. But some other islands, on the other hand, already had schools, already had this and that, right? So you can read that. In 1913, rural board was set up only on Berani, Bupong, Besa, and Sbaro, right? That Sbaro was added in 1929. And if, that, that kind of thing. Uh, so when it became political, though, when you need polling stations, then suddenly everybody took attention, of course. Next slide. Kan, biasa lah. And then, of course, uh, the other way, of course, is to um, uh, think about the complex interplay of uh, power structure and people's agency in landscape. They, we can see this through the richness of place names. So another area of my interest in Sauna Islands is that it has a particular richness in place names. The Singapore main island also is very rich in names, but the Southern Islands particularly so. Every feature has names. I've presented a compilation of such place names uh, for an invited lecture at the MOE Malay Language Centre in 2020, 23rd September. So the listing is there. So it's very interesting to see. I, I think it's a good thing the projector is large enough. You can see all the names of every Terembu Gayong, Tanjung Kombun, Tanjung Pakabat, Bagopayong, Tanjung Perpat Tinggi, right? So many names. And usually when you see Pulau Ayah Chawan or Ayah Merbau, that refers to a river. The Ayah is like Ayah Raja. That's the name of a river. The alternative to Sunai is Ayah. Yeah. And uh, later we'll come to Ayah Brani, I think. The next slide. Um, yeah, Ayah Brani is next. So I want to point out two interesting things. I'll go off script for a while. Pulau Ayah Brani is named after a little river called Ayah Brani. But later it got shortened to Pulau Brani. Pulau Belakang Mati is named after Sungai Belakang Mati. It's a sungai mati yang dah ada kat belakang pulau. Bukannya belakang kena mati pasal dia lanun. Merepek. Can we stop doing that kind of nonsense? It's nama sungai belakang mati. Please ah, Please. Sungai mati tahu kan? Ya. Yeah. Tapi dia di belakang pulau. Jadi namanya sungai belakang mati. Gitu saja. Tak ada kena mengena dengan backstab. Belakang mati is not grammatical. Thank you. So um, back to script. The landscape has such a density of names that each tell a story of a cultural landscape uh, that, that, that coexisted with colonial era interventions before extensive reclamation and reconfiguration of coastlines wiped out these uh, bookmarks of our cultural memory. But these names come down to us from colonial, colonial era surveying as well. So it's interesting to think about the interactions when the colonial surveyor asked about the names. Uh, we skip the next slide to the next slide. Skip it. Uh, so the third question, acknowledge the very real loss and pain of the destruction of entire settlements and livelihoods. Material possessions like kole and ruma. Next slide. Look at that. That's a kole right there. People built these things. I mean, and the next slide, houses. Thank you uh, to Indor Isman Putra, who I, I don't think he's here today. But we, we, we spoke a long time ago when we did the Pulau King uh, project. Uh, and this, these are 1991. I cannot imagine the pain I feel. If I had known in 1991, I would have gone, not gone. But at that time, I was completely ignorant about these things. So luckily, we have people like uh, uh, Mr. Jamal and as well as uh, Dr. Hamza, who actually visited these islands at that time. So my loss, my pain, is I never visited these islands uh, when they were still settled. Uh, so we also need to acknowledge the loss of dignity and of spirit, and to remember the precious skills connected with material culture and maritime practices and navigation that was summarily extinguished. Next slide. Appreciate the fact, you know, that Tukang Rumah, House Builders, this is from Professor Adi Jarahmat's book, Kilat Senja. And here at work on Pulau Brani, Mardiana Abu Bakar is here in the audience. That's her family home in the 1960s. The builders, the Tukang Rumah, Tuk Itam, is from Kampung Air Kalang. So Kampung Kalang Laut, I suppose. Huh? But very interesting, right? Once you start to ask who has these skills and where do they come from, you see that network. You nak bikin rumah dekat Pulau Brani, you ambil orang dari Kampung Kalang. 
I'm going to allow it. Quite interesting, right? But ne next slide. There's a, just appreciate the skill of piling into the, 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 the water, eh? piling into the... It, and it's very stable. Eh? So, for example, Brunei, the whole town used to be on water, and those piles are still there to this day. They didn't really change. Uh, because if you use Nibong piles, they don't rot in the water. Uh, okay, uh, next slide. So, we've seen house building and boat building. Both were the uh, simultaneous, uh, simultaneously forms of art and engineering skills. Just appreciate the engineering skills required that native builders, native builders possessed that have not had their continuation in our uh, on our shores today. No continuation. Dah tak tak boleh. Kalau kita nak rumah sekarang, dah tak boleh. Uh, we have to ask from Johor or from elsewhere. But we had these skills. And Singapore, orang Singapura, right? Sometimes celebrated in art. Uh, next slide. Sometimes celebrated in art and postcards as well. And finally, the fourth question. Next slide. We need to critically engage the top-down new structures that have transformed these landscapes. Yeah, we need to critically engage the top-down structures that have transformed these landscapes in, in, in interesting and uh, 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 sophisticated ways. Uh, to both be critical of it and to find opportunities within these. Uh, next slide. From plans to provide new amenities and facilities to the promotion, next slide, of these islands as sites to experience a different culture and, uh, and place, uh, for tourism mainly. Yeah? Uh, and next slide, as scenic playgrounds for the tourist, you know. Uh, and then of course now, next slide, as industrial zone, live firing area, dumping ground for trash, and the uh, luxury resort and recreation zone, uh, rec uh, and luxury residential uh, zone. So what am I talking about? Um, when we talk Southern Islands, uh, if you look at planning, it has shifted over time. Previously, Southern Islands referred to everything, right, in the electoral boundary. But later it changed. In planning terms, Southern Islands is just the, the islands in the blue circle. So some of the islands became Jurong Island industrial. And then what happened to the other islands? Either live firing or dumping ground. Next slide. Uh, these are, sorry, the red circles show us um, the islands that were promoted for tourism just now, okay? So at one point, Singapore actually promoted uh, the Sisters Islands, uh, pulau apa nama? Pulau Hantu dengan Pulau uh, Seking yeah, for tourism. But now only Southern Islands are under Sentosa Development Corporation for development to luxury whatever. And then you've got two landfill islands, Life Firing Zone and Jurong Island. Habis. Habis. Next slide. Um, so um, the gains are of course obvious, huh? monetary and all that. But so are the losses in both ecological and cultural terms. So in this new reconfiguration of coastlines, very drastic reconfiguration if you look at it, very artificial, right? Coastlines of terrains, of waterways, it is easy to forget the old cultural landscapes completely. Amnesia seems inevitable. Names vanish, places are lost. So the maritime life, it seems, is now reserved only for the very rich. No jong, no kole, more to houses, but instead yachts, docked in marinas, huh? exclusive and expensive. Now, we cannot turn back time. We cannot demolish these and rebuild. But the least we can do is not to forget. Right? The least we can do is not to erase the memory. Final slide. Not to erase the memory. Next slide. Next slide. Um, next slide again, sorry. Yeah, these are the... Yeah, next slide. So that kind of erasure, but not... I, re I remember the gasp from the audience when you saw this image. That is the extent to which we have lost contact, right? With these kinds of landscapes. Huh? So. Not to, at least the least we can do is not to erase the memory and public knowledge, uh, generally speaking, and also to the younger generation. So it's very good that this initiative is happening. And um, is there a way to resist complete forgetting and total erasure? So let me end by summarizing the four main points once more. The first, to recall and appreciate the special position of Singapore and Bintan, actually, uh, and of course the small islands. To Malay maritime historical memory and source in, 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 in the Malay sources, Second, to acknowledge the layers of arrivals and complex incorporation into host communities or societies and account for their complex histories. That's also a challenge. Number three, to recognize the very real loss from shifts, uh, from uh, skill, of skills sorry, and cultural knowledge, yeah? the loss of maritime material culture and possessions. And four is to recall, to re- uh, Reenact, yeah, to recount. Uh, these are all uh, ways to overcome the tragic loss of forgetting and disappearing. 
So to know is to keep the spirit alive. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Imran. It, I mean, like, it feels like a bullet train because usually Imran takes one hour to speak, but he has 10 minutes today. So, <laughs> so I think like, maybe we'll pass the time to Hamza, who has been doing like, quite a fair bit of research on the Southern Islands. So perhaps you might want to share with us on some sure. of the projects that you have done. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Selamat pagi. Um, well, I don't have a script because I tend to talk longer when I have a script. So I'm just going to wing it. Um, and um, basically, some of you would know that I've been working on the Southern Islands uh, with my father coming from Sambu Island in the Riau Archipelago and also having, you know, as Imran mentioned, a family on Pulau Saking um, means that um, I have close affiliations with the Southern Islands. And of course, we all live in Singapore, which is an island. We tend to forget that. Um, so we are all islanders, really. So we're calling all Singaporeans over today. Um, and um, I think that's the reason why I started working on the Southern Islands. The interest actually came from there, going back to Shafika's first question, um, to really try to uh, resurrect some of the lost histories, lost heritage uh, that uh, has been happening in Singapore over the years. Um, so um, the focus on my island specifically, uh, you, um, based on the research that I did for the National Heritage Board with my team, was uh, the Southern Islands, um, Pulau Skijang Pelepa, Pulau Skijang Bendera, Serengat, and uh, Kias Islands, right? So that's the focus. Initially, I wanted to do the whole of the Southern Islands, realized that that's a massive undertaking. It's not possible to do that. So we focus on these uh, few islands. Um, and uh, right now, I'm actually on another National Heritage Board project focusing on Jurong Island, or the islands that make up Jurong Island. So uh, that is something that I'm actually quite excited to be working on right now. But today, I just want to provide some reflections uh, on the, the work that, been done, that I've done uh, on the um, few islands that I mentioned earlier. And uh, in some ways, reiterate some of the points that Imran has already mentioned. Okay, so we always lament that Singaporeans, um, the younger generations especially, did not know that Singapore used to have over 60 islands around the main island. Um, but recently, there's been a lot of interest on these islands, right? And that's because of increasingly research being done by scholars. Um, it is also because of groups like Orang Laut SG and very passionate islanders that have come together to try to ensure that their heritage and their history is not forgotten. Um, and I think the pandemic had something to do with it. When Singaporeans couldn't go anywhere else, right, they all started going to the Southern Islands, uh, particularly uh, St. John's Island, Lazarus Island. Um, and businesses that used to ply boats between Singapore and the Riau Islands uh, and, and other countries, they also pivoted their businesses over to the Southern Islands as well. So now if you go to St. John's Island, for example, on the weekends, it's especially crowded, uh, something that uh, wasn't really the case in the past. Um, and, uh, but um, my, my, the point I'm trying to make here in this short time that I have is actually to just point out a few things that we need to keep in mind uh, when we're actually thinking about the Southern Islands. Uh, the first thing is, if you look at these maps up here, right, you can see the Southern Islands or the islands that I mentioned as it is today and also the islands as it was in the past. So in the past, you're basically going back to the place names that Imran was mentioning. Um, the two islands uh, that we now know as Lazarus Island and St. John's Island used to be known as St. John's Island West, St. John's Island East. There was maps that actually mentioned how the islands was known as St. You know, John's 1, St. John's 2. So, so there were many, many islands. And the first thing that I need to people, for people to remember is that these islands uh, used to be separate. Right? Now, I get annoyed every time people say that they're going to St. John's Island to go to Eagles Bay. Right? Because Eagles Bay is located not on St. John's Island, but on Lazarus Island. Right? So we start to think of these islands as one, even though they used to be separated in the past. And I think um, that uh, it also leads to the erasure of these islands. When we think about Pulau Smaka, we forget that Pulau Smaka is made up of both Pulau Smaka and Pulau Seking. Right? But because Pulau Seking is not there anymore, not visible anymore, um, we tend to forget. Uh, that island, right? So we need to sort of like think about the independent islands, uh, St. John's Island as its own island, Lazarus Island is its own, Pulau Seringat of course was a small island, but not many people realise that Pulau Seringat and Pulau Kias were actually the original settlements uh, before they actually moved to Lazarus Island when the islands were inundated, right? So all these histories can only come about if we think about these islands as separate independent islands, right? And I think that it's good to basically have different groups working on these islands 
um, and try to preserve the heritage of these islands as well. Uh, place names, of course, St. John's Island, Lazarus Island, we know them as Pulau Seringat Bendera, Pulau Seringat uh, Pelepa, um, uh, Pulau, Seringat, Pulau Skijang Bendera, and Pulau Skijang uh, Pelepa. Uh, but then you know, people don't really ask about how these names come about. So we need to basically uh, think about how these names came about. How did Pulau Skijang become St. John's Island? It's because the British could not really pronounce Skijang. Right? So Skijang, Skijang, Skijang became St. John's Island. Right? But there have been many different speculations as well in terms of the history of these place names. And I think it's important for us to remember each and every one of them because they all reflect a certain uh, period in Singapore's history that we cannot forget. Okay, so next slide. And the other thing that I want to point out, the second point is in terms of visibility. Right? Now when uh, people go down to um, Lazarus Island or Pulau Skijang, uh, Pelepa, um, they will not see anything, all right? It is amazing how in the past, this is basically what it used to look like, all right? So this is the picture of Pulau Skijang Pelepa in the past, and how when people go down to these islands, they don't see these things, so out of sight, out of mind, right? They don't think about these things, and people don't actually go down there for tours, simply because when people cannot see anything, they are not interested, right? But uh, what's important to realize is that um, there are also structures, for example, at Pulau um, Skijang Bendera or St. John's Island, that even today the stories are not known yet. So there's a lot of research that needs to be done. Yeah? Next slide. Right? And there's also the issue with uh, the fact that when you go to uh, places like St. John's Island and Lazarus Island, the focus is almost always on nature. Right? If you look at all the storyboards that you have on St. John's Island, it's predominantly on nature, even though there are important cultural elements that uh, can be told, the stories can actually be told uh, through these boards as well. Um, and, uh, and I think that um, it is important for us to try to insert some of the stories of cultural heritage in these tours, right? so that it doesn't just become about nature itself. I can imagine that because National Parks Board is involved uh, in the project and part of St. John's Island is of course part of the Sisters Island Marine Park. It means that nature is the mandate, right? So stories of nature comes out. But we also cannot forget that even nature is cultural, right? So there are cultural aspects to natural things that you see around you. The trees, right? The fish, the oceans, right? You can see the signs of it, you can see the natural aspects of it, but they were very important aspects of the Orang Laut, Orang Pulau community. Right? And these stories need to be brought out. The stories of the fishing activities, the stories of all the beliefs associated with fishing, the stories of all the plants, flora and fauna that used to be very much a part of the island communities. Right? So, um, so that's uh, the second thing. And finally, the third thing is basically related to this slide here. We cannot forget the islanders. Right? Now, um, you know, we have a lot of these tours, but I wonder sometimes whether these tours are actually done in consultation with the islanders themselves. Right, I can say that even though these islanders are no longer living on the islands, their heart is very much uh, left on the island, or a part of their heart is very much left on the islands, and they still think about it a lot. Right? And they're very interested to be part of any initiative to develop these islands. Right? So I think, um, as a, a, a last point, all right, we need to remember that despite things like land reclamation that has led to all these islands being joined up and heritage of these islands lost, uh, despite the fact that there are mandates that, um, that, that sort of like leads to certain aspects of the islands being promoted more than others, um, we need to, at the end of the day, go back to the islanders and try to get their stories as much as possible before they die off one by one. I mean, one of the major challenges of doing the projects is that the older generations of islanders are not around anymore. So we cannot get a lot of the stories of origins of these islands and all that. Um, but I think that whatever that we can salvage, we should salvage. And uh, with that, I think we can basically not only have a, whole, a, a holistic history of these islands, but also get the islands to have a stake, uh, islanders to have a stake in the ways in which the islands have developed over time. Right now, uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pass the mic over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamza. Yes, and I think like on that point where we talk about how stories become conduit for memories and to preserve all of this, like, you know, cultural heritage, cultural memory, um, perhaps nothing is more effective than the realm of literature. And um, I would like to invite Pak Jamal to perhaps share a little bit more about... Because um, he recently published his novel, Ombak Selatan, which you can get um, at the foyer if you would like to. Um, but Ombak Selatan, 
um, to summarize, I would say like the plot line looks at the interconnected narratives between um, people who lived on Pulau Sudong and those who live in Kampung Pasir Panjang, which is, I will say like a relationship that not many of us will think, you know, like something that's quite immediate. So maybe Pak Jamal boleh kongsi sedikit tentang um, hasil karya Pak Jamal. Terima kasih, Sabika. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan selamat pagi and good morning to every one of you. Uh, saya ingin berkongsi lah ya, tentang bagaimana I'm quite lucky lah. Ya. Saya rasa beruntung kerana pada tahun awal tahun 70-an saya bekerja di Kementerian Sekitaran unit penyiasatan penyakit-penyakit berjangkit. Jadi saya ada ada assess, saya ada satu uh, satu kebenaran untuk ber, berinteraksi dengan orang pulau eh, bila ada kes-kes penyakit ni. Uh, kecuali Pulau Senang, semua pulau-pulau di selat, di Singapura ni saya pernah sejarah. So for those who um, are not able to understand Malay, basically Pak Jamal shared that um, he used to work with the health department. So part of his job required him to um, go to the different islands, particularly when there are cases of certain diseases. So he was able to access all of these islands with the exception of Pulau Senang. Uh, ada dua insiden yang menyebabkan saya ingin menulis Umbah Selatan. Pertama, uh, saya kenal beberapa orang yang tinggal di Pulau Sudong. Dan saya, bila saya cakap saya kenal tu, saya tahu hati nurani mereka. Saya tahu masalah mereka. Saya tahu hasrat mereka. Jadi, mereka ni ada masalah. Eh. Contoh yang paling besar, ya, kalau hari ni ada orang yang pernah hidup sebagai nelayan. Eh. Masalah besar nelayan di Pulau Pulau Selatan ialah Bila takapan mereka itu tidak boleh dijual langsung, mereka terpaksa menjual kepada orang tengah. Dipanggil perai. Ini masalah. Mereka terjerat dengan masalah itu secara sosial, secara ekonomi dan mereka tidak boleh lepas itu. Kenapa? Mereka beli enjin sangkut itu bagi orang perai. Jadi tak ada tak ada sebab untuk mereka untuk menjual langsung di pasar. Eh? Okay. <laughs> So it's challenging to do translation on the spot, but okay, I will try. So, um, so I think like what Pak Jamal mentioned was that um, he was called, you know, to write this novel because um, there were two incidents that you know left quite an indelible mark in in his mind and in his memory. So, and these are stories that are based on his personal interactions with some of the inhabitants and the residents of the islands. And when he said that um, he knows them, it's not just like, you know, acquaintance, but he really, um, he really knows them like on a personal level about their dreams, their ambitions, as well as all of their problems. So one of the issues that they faced, particularly the, fisher the, fishing, the fisherman communities on these islands, um, is that of the perai ikan or the middleman. So the function of this middleman was that they will, they almost have had like an exclusive um, deal with these fishermen where they buy the fishes that these fishermen caught um, and then they will resell it. But um, on the flip side is that these fishermen are not allowed to directly sell their catch to others. Um, and they are also trapped in this sort of like exploitative economic system because a lot of their equipment, for example, the engines that's required for their fishing boats, they will, um, yeah, it's engine loan. In I mean like that, yeah. Engine loans in the sense that they loan it from the middleman, but you know, in to pay it off, of course, they have to keep selling their cash to to this particular middleman. Yeah. Uh, pengalaman pribadi, eh, personal. Eh. Uh, saya waktu itu bekerja di Pulau Sudong, saya nak balik, saya nampak seorang nelayan, saya dah lupa namanya. Dia tangkap, sekur, dia tangkap, tangkap pandai termasuk ikan tenggiri batang. Kalau orang tahu ikan tenggiri batang ni susah dapat dan mahal. Eh. Jadi bila saya nampak, dia, saya nak beli. Tapi dia kata, Pak Jamal, you cannot buy from me. Saya kata, kenapa pula awak yang tangkap? Kata, dia tunjukkan sebuah kedai. Sebab kedai, saya kata, kenapa saya mesti di sana? Saya tak ada jual langsung. Lepas tu saya pergi dari kedai tu. Dari kedai tu saya balik semula, penelayan tanya berapa? Pak Jamal beli, saya kata, $12. Dia 
Dia kata saya sebab saya boleh jual 7 dolar je. Kenapa tak jual dengan saya? Tak boleh. Dia tunjuk pula pada bot, bot yang ada enjin tu kan. Jadi ini ini saya kata kenapa mesti begini? Itulah masalah kami. Kami terjerat dengan ini semua. Jadi saya fikir sampai bila sampai bila-bila kalau anak tak selagi kami tak mampu kita tak terjerat lah. Itu satu. Nombor dua yang menyebabkan saya ingin menulis ialah di Pulau Sudong ada sebuah sekolah. Sekolah Melayu Pulau Sudong. Ada seorang guru tahun 70-an tu guru tu kawan pribadi saya, Cikgu Dahlan. Saya rakam dalam novel ini. Cikgu Dahlan ini adalah guru terakhir di Pulau Sudong. Satu-satunya guru dia lah guru besar. Dia lah guru ilmu kira-kira ilmu islam, ilmu alam, semuanya dia. Guru disiplin. Anak murid ini cuma 23 orang saya. Karena lain tu semua dah berpindah. Dah pindah ke mainland. Eh? Karena hambatan-hambatan ini, hambatan-hambatan ini kerja. Eh? Jadi 23 orang murid ni kadang disatukan lah. Dajah satu, dajah dua dah tak ada. Karena dajah satu, dajah dua dah ditutup. Karena anak-anak murid dah dihandak. Dah berpindah ke mainland. Eh? Pulau waktu pergi tanah besar. Jadi Raja tiga, raja empat jadi satu kelas. Raja lima, raja enam jadi satu kelas. Eh? Jadi setiap kelas ada dua belas orang dan tiga belas orang. Itulah kurang. Eh? Jadi bila dia dia dapat tiba masa depan sekolah Melayu ni akan hilang. Eh? Jadi dia orang yang bersemangat. Eh? Jadi waktu di sakit tu saya dapat ziarah dia. Dia kata, Jamal kalau saya ada seorang anak murid, saya, tak, saya kalau ada anak saya tak akan suruh jadi guru. Kenapa cikgu cakap macam ini? Cikgu bertahun mengajar di Pulau, Sud Pulau Sudung. Dia kata, dia ni pergi sekolah sebelum subuh dia kena. Dia tinggal di Tuan Payung. Dia akan ambil bas. Eh? Kau ambil bas, di apa? Di turun di Tanjung Melayu. Di Tanjung Melayu, dia naik bot. Bot ni kadang-kadang, rain or shine, dia kena dedah. Kadang-kadang, air 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 laut tu di bibir, di bibir perahu tu sehingga satu inci je. Pengorbanan itu betul besar. Eh? Jadi itu sebabnya saya menulis kerana saya perlu rakam. Saya perlu rakam pengorbanan orang-orang lama betapa pentingnya mereka ni dalam membangun kita sekarang ini. So the other incident that that um, well left a deep mark on him um, is about this school teacher on Pulau Sudong. It was the last Malay school on the island um, and this teacher also happened to be the only teacher. So he was principal, discipline master, maths teacher, geography teacher, everything all rolled in one. Um, and because at that time, a lot of the um, inhabitants have started moving over to mainland Singapore. So the number of students in the school has also dwindled. So I think at that time, there was only like 23 students. And because there were so few of them, the different levels were collapsed. So. Um, primary three and four were in the same class, primary five and six were in the same class. Um, but this particular teacher, he didn't stay on the island, he was actually staying in Tuapayo. So every morning, he would have to take the ferry from Tanjung Belaya all the way to the island and at the end of the school day, come back to Singapore. Yes, okay, so actually I've been given the signal to open <laughs> this session to Q&A. So if anyone in the audience has any questions for any of our panelists, please feel free to, um, yeah, to share and to raise them. Okay, I see one hand. My name is Al. The, the question that I have is about oral history, um, because you're talking about literature, but how, how is recording being done and where are things being um, kept for the future and future generations? Oral history, where has it been like, captured? Um, yeah. Okay, so basically for the project that, um, that my team and I did uh, for Pulau Skijang Bendera, Pulau Skijang Pelepa and Seringat, um, they were done under the auspices of the National Heritage Board grant um, and all the items were passed over to NHB. Uh, so the oral histories and all that you should be able to find at National Archives um, eventually if not already. Um, and, um, and I think that in terms of disseminating the information as well, uh, there's been a lot of projects. So since the project ended, I've been working, for example, with the Sentosa Development Corporation, with Friends of Marine Park, my community group and all that in terms of organizing tours. 
uh, and getting the islanders involved as much as possible. Uh, and through that, it's not just a matter of having the information, uh, which sometimes can sit on the ar shelves of archives without being touched at all for many years, but really to just put the information out there. Um, and, um, and hopefully, a um, wider net is cast in terms of who actually understands the independent histories of these islands. Next question. Yeah, so if there's any next question, you can... I, I mean, I, I think like, because from here, we can't really see. <laughs> we can't really see you, so please either stand up or <laughs> wave, like, yeah. Yeah, right at the back. Is that a hand? Yes, that's a hand. No, I think that's a no. That, that, that. No, no, no. No, no, no. Ah. Oh, no, no. He okay. No, it's not his hand. Scratching his head. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's Agus. So is there any anyone with any questions? There, there, there. There's a hand up there. I'm just seeing so many hands up there, so I don't know who's. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So if there isn't any question, um, we can move over. We can switch over there, to the there, next there, panel. There. Oh, is there? there? Okay. One one final question. Didn't yeah, I didn't see. Oh, Faris. 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 Hi, Faris. <laughs> Faris, you move. Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, interesting presentation. Terima kasih, Pak Jamal juga. Um, I guess this question uh, goes out to probably Hamza and Imran, or uh, anyone can take it. Anyway, it's. I'm wondering if anyone can elaborate further on the relationship between orang laut and negeri, for example, because if we want to talk about the concept, the, the context of present day Singapore. What's the difference or relationship between the the uh, Malays and the islands and the town Malays, for example, um, and how do we make sense of that? Uh, these categories, I think, it's really important, um, especially when we have this catch-all term like indigenous, right? Which doesn't really, it's not very, not the most helpful all the time to get to all these distinctions. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, originally, of course, people didn't split hairs about these terms because everybody just became eventually... Uh, so, for example, if you say anak negeri and anak, anak uh, let's say, what was your other term? Uh, orang... Um, I an, think an, uh, an, uh, orang, lau, orang darat and... Oh, okay, and okay, yeah, okay. So, I mean, um, <coughs> maybe there's so many le levels here. If you are an orang laut or orang selat, then you are affiliated to particular structures of authority directly answerable to some Malay chief yes. or your own batin or jenang first and then to a Malay chief. So it's a power structure thing. You can escape that actually or you can abscon, right? So it's actually about, uh, and then it's particular lineages. So once you break away from a lineage, you can come from another lineage on another island and you break away, then you can become another degree, right? You serve another, you know how it's feudal system, right? You serve another chief, let's say. You know, you could do that. But then there are those who don't belong to these group things. Uh, they, are the, um, they are the ones who generally be become called Malayu, right? So the Malayus are, di are different in that sense. They, don't, they, will, they can become anak buah of some Malay chief, but they don't belong to certain jenang or batin. Jenang or batin distinguishes orang laut, orang selat. Yeah? So if you read the slide just now, for example, the Sulatu Salatin, the uh, Sudara Melayu, they, they give names like Batin Singapura, Jenang So and So, Batin Sapi. So these are very clear markers of Orang Selat or Orang Laut identity. Otherwise, for the Malayus, it's not, we don't really use those terms. Um, in fact, we even adopt Javanese terms like Demang. You know? Yeah, very strange. So Malays are Javanized in that sense, but not the Orang Laut. They were never Javanized. So, so, I mean, I'm going too complex into the history, but then you also ask uh, apa, anak negeri. There's anak dagang and anak negeri. That's a different distinction. So, in the Melayu sphere, and many of the islanders are from the Melayu sphere, and then they incorporated themselves into the orang laut sphere. So, it's very complex. But to answer the orang negeri uh, versus orang dagang, right? So, in Malay, uh, negeri. Negeri is the term for uh, actually port kingdoms, you know. Now, we think it's just territory. Actually, it's the port kingdom, the capital, the port capital. So in the port capital way of looking at things, anak negeri means those born here. Anak dagang means those who travel for trade or others. Other, there's anak santri as well, those who go for uh, dagang dan santri is the phrase that Malays use. Santri is your studying, usually religious studies. Then there is the laut dengan darat. Yeah, that's interesting. So kampung beduk laut dengan kampung beduk darat, the people are quite different. Same thing with Aigemuruh, ada laut dengan darat dengan tengah. My mom lived at the tengah, my mom's family. 
but they were affiliated to the sea. So yang laut lebih all fishermen. Yang darat not necessarily kerja polis lah, pion lah, apalah. So there is that darat, laut and sometimes tengah like my mom's case. I hope that answers. There's a lot more to cover but roughly it's like that. Thank you. Sorry, short, yeah. qu short question yeah. for Dr. Imran. That's okay. So, I'm uh, sorry. Um, oh, Alfie. Yeah. I'm sorry to spoil the fun, but <laughs> I'm being requested to switch over to the next panel session. But if you have any uh, um, ex additional questions for our panelists, you can feel free to ask them um, you know, after this entire session, after this entire event. Yeah. So I would like to thank, let's, let's put our hands together to thank once again all our panelists. <laughs>